Uh, hi, guys. Let's, uh, let's invite the kids downstairs. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for our kids. Lord, bless them and keep them. May they uh, learn more about you and grow closer to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Kids, you're invited to, downstairs, to go downstairs for Sunday school. All right, let's answer a couple questions about that video. First question that everyone wants to know when I've shown the video, who does the David Attenborough voice? His name is Caleb Feltus. He's a GCer. He's, uh, a lot of you guys know his family. He is um, like a language guy. So he's actually uh, like really, really savvy when it comes to that. And he, he are, he's, although he's fully American, speaks with a British accent normally. Um, so he's a strange person, but we do appreciate Caleb. And uh, so um, second question people want to know is where is that room located? that we got Micah coming in and out of the cave. That is at the sponsor's home. Jeff Sponsor had built like a full rainforest with like a cave for, as a bedroom for, uh, um, well, it was Emily, Emily's and then Hannah took over when she was older and now, um, now it's empty. But it was cool that we were able to use that. Also in Jeff Sponsor's room, there's a full on crashed space or in a different room full-on crashed spaceship and uh, that was uh, Jake's and then became Micah's room so um, really really special room but um, I think that's all of the questions that people tend to have about the video um, you guys all got it though right it's a planet earth video who here has seen a planet earth video I love planet earth featuring David Attenborough. I watch, I get every single one. And if you guys want to come over, okay, I got the whole, I got the whole thing, all right? Full HD, stereo cranked. I want to hear every bird chirp, every bug crawl, right? I want to hear that beautiful English accent as in high def as possible. And I love those Planet Earth videos. So when, um, you know, when we were talking about God's good creation, all I could think about is how much I love planet Earth. I just love planet Earth. And uh, I, I love planet Earth videos because you get to see and learn about all these cool animals that maybe you wouldn't know. I, I think as adults, we need to get back to the basics. Just a little bit of talking about favorite animals more often, okay? Just talking about favorite animals, favorite colors, we need to get back to the basics, okay? Um, my favorite, okay, just so you guys know, my favorite color is the color of space sky. That's my favorite color. And then my favorite animal is a mantis shrimp. Well, my favorite animal is my dog, Jeff, but he's not as impressive as a mantis shrimp. You see, mantis shrimp, did you guys know this? Do you guys know about mantis shrimp? They're huge shrimps, and they're like different colors, and they can see, into, they can see more colors than any other animal. It's kind of insane. And so the mantis shrimp, if they were the size of humans, they, they have like a little fist that comes out of them. You know, they do the scurry thing, and then they have a fist. So mantis shrimp, if they, if they were the size of a human, right, and that punch, they could punch a baseball into space. Right, which is very impressive, quite the punch, okay, from a little shrimpy. All right, if my dog, who I do love, if, if my dog was the size of a human, it would mostly only impact my yard. Um, but, but I don't think he could impact space. We love animals. We love the planet Earth. Um, Kais and I were watching this show, and um, in it, it, it opens up, and it was like a just a horrible car crash in this show. Horrible car crash, okay? And uh, like a semi collided with um, this guy and he had a horse, a show horse. And uh, both the show horse and the guy in the truck died. And I looked over and Kaisa's, you know, she's a little emotional. And I was like, Kaisa, are you okay? Like, she's like, I just feel really bad for the horse. <laughs> I go, what about the, the truck driver? Not so bad, you know, like we just, we feel for animals, right? We just love animals. That, that kind of story, her going, eh, you know, like it reminds me of a different story. And this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I think it's important. 
Um, Kaisa does, opens, Kaisa's my wife, and she opens up and has the coffee shop on Wednesdays for us. And Mackenzie, she was like, oh, can you make me this new fancy drink? And so Kaisa's like, sure, and she whipped it up, and uh, she gave it to her. And Mackenzie's like, oh, this is good, Kaisa. You should try it. And Kaisa's like, because she already tried it. She's like, yeah, it is really good. I already tried it. <laughs> so be careful when you're ordering from the coffee shop. <laughs> no, uh, I think that, so I was talking to Kaisa about that, and I think she made a good point. But, and, and, and she was saying that, like, she, sorry, she, she was saying that she's sad that, you know, like, uh, that in the last year, because we haven't been together as much, that she, she, she was worried about all those, like, moments that we've missed out on. And so she was a little sad, I think, you know. But she, she, it was like a bittersweet, you know. She thought it was sweet. She thought it was funny that, you know, she was drinking Mackenzie's drink behind her back. But then also bitter, like, she's like, man, like, it's been so long since we've been having these things. So, you know, that, she, my wife, she's so amazing. We, we love... We love planet Earth. We, we love the creatures, the plants, the sky, the water. The, when, when, when the elders, when we first sat down and we were talking about God's good creation, I think um, an, uh, an illustration that we were using to, to kind of inspire us was that no matter what you believe about God and no matter what you believe about, <clears throat> no matter what you believe about God and no matter what you believe about the universe, nature impacts you. Whether you believe in God or not, nature impacts you. When you stand on a beach and you watch the blue sky turn pink and orange as the sun sets or rises, you ooh and ah at the mere color of it. The turning of another day, people line up at beaches to watch the sun rise and set. When you go to the beach any other time, when you go to the beach any other time, it is a hectic place. Frisbees, food, sunscreening, water splashing. But when you go, everyone stops and looks. When you go and you see the sun rise or set, everyone stops and looks. It's peaceful. We all know why the sun looks the way that it does. We all know why the colors in the sky look the way that they do. And we can describe why they look that way, but we can't describe why we think it's so beautiful. It's just inherent. It's in us. We love nature. We love at the beach when the ocean pushes us back. We love when we're driving and the earth's air pushes through our windows. We love when birds sing. We love when trees dance. We love when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie. That's amore. We look at God's good creation and it hits us. It hits us. Nature impacts us. We appreciate it. In Genesis 1, we learn about, in God's good creation, Genesis 1, we learn a lot about our feeling towards this planet Earth. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Lord, guard my heart. Let's hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Genesis 1, verse 28 says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of this whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours with food, and to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. Um, if, you're, if you have your Bible, I, I recommend going to Genesis 9, I'm going to be there in a little bit, but not there quite yet. Also, Mackenzie, you reading scripture today was so peace, like so nice. It was so, I honestly want a whole album of just Dan Shenander holding a C major and Mackenzie reading the Bible to me. If that, 
yeah, we need that as a record or something. Like we, you know, just the hits, you know, Psalm 23, Romans 8, you know, John 3, 16. All right, just make a greatest hits, Mackenzie and Dan Shenander. We, okay, back to the sermon. It's fun having ADD. We have God-given orders to to subdue the earth. Uh, There's been a lot of debate about um, what does subdue the earth means, and and there are many avenues that we can take um, when talking about Christian environmental ethics. And suffice it to say, my 20-minute sermon before we go to the church picnic is not going to be able to cover all of those avenues today. Um, But, you know... We should at least try. God has given us authority to take care of the plants and the animals. And so when we, we look at the Noahic Covenant, which is in Genesis 9, the Noahic Covenant, um, because God reinstates this very, very important thing that, he, that, that is brought up in Genesis 1, and he reinstates it here with uh, the covenant that God gave Noah after the flood. God gives us three relationships that we ought to pay attention to when dealing with the authority that we have been given on this planet Earth. The three relationships that God has called us into, and we're going to read it here in Genesis 9, the three relationships are the relationship with the planet Earth, the relationship with one another, other people of the planet Earth, and then finally, a relationship with the Lord of the Earth. Genesis 9, it's I'm going to read a little bit, and then I'll take a break talking about the first relationship. Read a little bit, talk, talk about the second relationship. Read a little bit, talk about the third relationship. Genesis 9, are you guys there? I gave you guys so much time to get there. Okay. <laughs> then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Oh, that sounds familiar. Okay. Thank you, Ross. The, 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 the fear and dread of you will fall on all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky on every creature that moves along the ground and all the fish in the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves about will be food for you. Just as I give you the green plants, I now give you everything. But, but you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. You see, he reinstates here what we saw with... Uh, with uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis, and, and we have this, this commandment again, to be fruitful, and that all creatures, both high and low, are given into our hands. This is a, the first of the three relationships that God has called us into, to this planet Earth, or relationship to the planet Earth. Let me, for a moment here, talk to the unbelievers in the audience, okay? I know that there's plenty of you. You guys are all thirsty. So um, all you non-believers, and if you are a believer, okay, this is still going to be valuable. Probably, possibly, maybe, probably. Um, Because unbelievers, we do know a lot of naturalists, okay? And uh, naturalists... Naturalists are those who believe in only the material thing. They don't believe in the supernatural. So the idea of a creator, that is seen as a huge act of faith, and they can't take that leap because that is a supernatural thing. God and miracles don't exist. So let me talk for a moment to the naturalists. So naturalists typically believe in two things. The first thing is that we are here in our current state, we're here due to some sort of evolution. Most likely the Darwinist evolution, which states that survival of the fittest is how we have gotten here uh, to this current planet that we know it. And then they believe this other thing is true. Naturalists often believe this other thing is true, that humans ought to care about the Earth, which is why we celebrate Earth Day and why we recycle and have a moral obligation to take care of this planet Earth. And this is where I have confusion regarding naturalism. No amount of genetic mutation can occur that would cause us to have moral obligation to care about the planet Earth. It's survival of the fittest, baby. 
No amount of genetic mutation can cause moral obligation. The locust will eat and eat. It does not care if other bugs get the chance to eat. That's survival of the fittest, baby. Humans, why are naturalists so inclined to tell humans not to eat and eat, not to consume and consume, not to not recycle? <laughs> right? Uh, the, the, the naturalists will say, ah, the locusts, they can live that way, but we as humans, we ought not to. We're not to just eat and eat. And this goes on unchecked. Because uh, naturalists believe that humans have higher moral ground than locusts. Because humans ought to know better. And we have a sense that we ought to steward the planet well. Although they don't use that language, they mean it. And that's a lot of oughts. That's a lot of oughts for a religion that's based on moral relativism. A naturalist will say, all morals are relative, but you must recycle and not bad an eye. Do you guys get that? There's no such thing as moral good or bad, but in the meantime, you must recycle and care after all the animals. And it's like, huh, that's a moral obligation. We, as Christians, we have answers for these things because we do believe that humans are different. And we do believe that humans are special. That we have a God-given call and reason to protect the good creatures of this planet Earth. And that reason is that it's not Mother's Earth. It's my Father's. It's my Dad's Earth. And when my Dad tells me to look after something, I do. When my parents are away and Dad calls me and says, Caleb, I need you to look after the plants in my home, I say, yes, Dad, because it's his, and I am in a great relationship with him. And I love my dad. Mother Earth, it's my father's, and he has asked us to look after it. Let me follow that up with a quick word to the Christians, I guess. Now that I've called out the naturalists. Was there a bit of smugness when I was talking about that? Because I feel a little smug, if I'm honest. When I'm, when I'm talking about morals, and I, I really do feel that ethically Christians have the best, the best stance on how to live this life. Not, not that we do it perfectly, but that we have the best answers, at least. But I was feeling a little, a little smug. It's like, ah, yes. Us Christians, we have a reason because we, we believe that humans are better. We believe that humans are special. Ah, yes. You silly naturalists. Uh, and I was like, check your smugness. <laughs> Not I. The Holy Spirit. He was like, Cal, check your smugness. Because in this there's some clarifying that God does, right? He says, you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And that's, you know, easy to follow enough, but God gives us the commandment and is already like, okay, but you're probably going to mess it up. So let me give a couple more. Because we're not perfect. So when we say that we ought to care for the planet Earth, that we ought to notice the beauty of the trees, that we have a moral obligation to take care of my father's planet, our sinfulness might keep us from doing it well. So even though we have a great answer as to why, our sinfulness might be stopping us from doing it well. You guys catch that? In verse 5 it says, and this is, we're going to, the second relationship. In verse 5 it says, And for your lifeblood, and for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from every, 
and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. The second relationship that God has given us is to the people of the earth. The first relationship is to the plants and animals on the earth, to the planet earth itself. The second relationship is to the people on the earth. God cares about every person on this earth. God cares about every person on this earth. We ought to as well. And again, we know. We feel that moral obligation. Progressives, man, they care for every human on earth. But they have a way about it. But they, they care for every person on this earth. Why? Who says who says that we're to care for every person on earth? We are ingrained with the who says complex. Kids, right? If kids are at the playground and uh, one kid takes another kid's swing, they go, hey, that's my swing. The kid says, oh yeah? Who says? There's got to be someone who says. Where's this grand authority coming from? Why? Why ought we care about every human being on this earth? God says so. That's enough for me, because I love my God. It's his design for us to be fruitful, to multiply, to be known, and to be loved by him. We are made in his image. We are to respect our neighbor. And this means that our charity, our missions and our callings, and our day-to-day -day life must be filtered by this that we see every person is made in the image of God. That we see every person is made in the image of God. When we see injustice being done, do we say, ah, they get what they deserve? Or do we say, they're getting what God deserves? Because God deserves so much. God's image is on that person. When we do for the least of these, we do it for him. What we do for the least of these, we do for him. And who's last will be first. If we start seeing people like that, with that filter, we might actually have the gall to say that people will know us by our love. The final relationship found in verse 8 then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds and livestock and the wild animals, all, these, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth, I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed in the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth? And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. This third relationship is so full of grace. Every covenant that God makes is so full of grace. The Noah covenant is not an exception. One second. You see, we have purpose on this earth. We have purpose. We have a calling, a God-given purpose, God-given calling on this earth to care for the planet, to care for the animals and the creepy crawlies and humans too. We're, we're, we're given this responsibility. But if we live by purpose alone, without any measure for success, we will be crushed by our purpose. We'll be crushed by our calling. That is why God must intervene, must bring us this third relationship. 
full of grace. Because we know that in our sinfulness that we will never care for our planet perfectly. Although we shouldn't try. And we know that in our sinfulness we'll never care for people, one another, perfectly. Although we shouldn't try. And they say, although we shouldn't try, although we, we should try to love animals and people perfect. You guys got that. Okay, great. But we know that we ain't going to do it perfectly. And that's that sinfulness. That's that sinfulness. And everyone feels that. God given purpose, God-given calling that impacts the image of us, every person feels that. Every person feels the need to take care of the earth. Every person values a sunset. Now there's debate on how to do it the best, but every person feels that. Every person feels the desire to care for one another. Now there's debate, and if they don't, Everyone else has unanimously agreed you are a monster. If you fight dogs, you are a monster. If you don't care for people, you are a monster. But in our sinfulness, that is where this third relationship comes in. You see, rainbows only appear when it's stormy, after some rain, and then the light comes in. It's at that conjunction of both dark and stormy and light that the rainbow appears. And that's exactly where God meets us in this relationship with our planet and with one another. See, we have been given authority, but we know that we can't do it perfectly. And so, if we all had a bow, and we feel the pressure, we, if we all had a bow and we feel this pressure to take care of the planet, to take care of one another, what are we going to do with that bow? We're going to either aim it at those who disagree with us, or we're going to aim it at ourselves because we realize that we're not good enough to do it on our own. So we either crush one another or we crush ourselves. Which is why this third relationship is so important. God has set the rainbow. And if you look at a rainbow from our perspective, the arrow will shoot up at him. That's grace. That's grace. Don't crush others. Don't be crushed by yourself. Accept the grace that God has given us by setting his war bow aimed at himself. And every sin, every dark and stormy thing that we feel inside of ourselves, that we don't take care of this planet good enough, accept that every sin was dealt with in Jesus Christ. How beautiful. Let me leave you with a challenge, church. Don't care for the earth in order to get a pat on the back from God. Care for the earth because It's beautiful. Notice the beauty of him in it. Take care of one another, not to get a pat on the back from God or from humans, but because God is beautiful and his image is worth protecting. Every person has a piece of him in them. Enjoy the beauty of the earth and enjoy the beauty of one another. And when you are not good enough, or when others are not good enough, remember the rainbow that God has put, set his bow down. What I want you guys to do 
is to go and look at a sunset. This is your homework from the pastor. To go and look at a sunset. And if you could, bring someone who might not know Jesus yet. If you could, if you feel, if you could, to go and look at the sunset with one another. And I want you to ask them these two questions. The first question is, why do you think the sunset is so important to us? And then the second question is, how did you come to that conclusion? We're not, I'm not saying refute naturalism to them, <laughs> all right? And then make sure that you tell them the full gospel message, okay? And like, that's not your goal, all right? Our goal, all right, is to put a little rock in their shoe, all right? That they might be, that they might not have ever wondered why the sunset is so important and why they have come to that conclusion, all right? Put, just put a little rock in their shoe. You don't even have to mention Jesus, although I, you're totally welcome to. You just don't have to, all right? Just have a conversation and put a rock in their shoe. And for us, when doing that, we'll find the, and we'll see the beauty of the earth and the beauty of people. Let's stand and pray and we'll eat some food together, eh? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the plants in the sky, for the plants on the earth and the birds in the sky, the fish in the water. Thank you. Lord, we see how beautifully and wonderfully made you've made, you've made this planet. Lord, help us to protect it. And help us to wonder aloud with one another and with those who might not know you. And let us see the value in this good creation that you've given us. Lord, bless us. Let us have an awesome time eating with one another. Let us have an awesome time of fellowshipping with one another. Lord, bless those who have uh, prepared the Olhoffs, Lord, who have done tremendous work to make sure that this picnic goes well. Lord, bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, guys.